Ta-da. It's not a thing. just fed her so she's kind of fat and sassy. She had a nice big juicy caterpillar off a cabbage plant. She was very happy with that. This is that bait I was telling you about that these collectors have been using so they were that were they were successful in getting a black witch moth. It's really cool. I think, hey guys, do you still have the moth? Can you would you mind showing it? But look how big it is. It's really, really beautiful. When I was growing up, my mother and stepfather owned a large piece of land, 24 acres, and I would spend a lot of time outside just kind of poking around and finding things. And what I loved about the natural world is I loved to see things rot. Something about insects it, it kind of approaches that place in us that, that is, is the same fascination that we have in circuses for things like a bearded lady. They're just sort of like outside of our day-to-day -day experience. And, and so I think that, that you know, mortality is sort of got this strange beauty and this kind of dark draw for us. If you've ever spent any time digging around in compost, you'll know that there are some really incredible creatures in there. Some that um, look like really large, kind of nasty things. Like there's a part in the Wrath of Khan where they drop a, a bug into the guy's ear and it's supposed to go in and eat his brain. and, and uh, there's a lot of things in your compost that look just like that and even without ever seeing that that clip in film you still have that sense of like whoa what is that okay you want it like everybody else's Felix yeah. I recognized in myself if I were going to be a really successful bench scientist in the current way that academia works I would really need to be devoting my whole self to that and I have a family and I wanted to make sure I had time also to be a mother and uh, so I've sort of retooled a little bit and now I spend more time teaching and doing outreach and engagement. Did you get it? Yeah. Wow, you actually did. I actually got a washed one. Nice catch. Ever since I was a little kid, I'd be wandering around in, in the fall or in the summer I was just always intrigued by the insects, the small things. I was little. Some people are intrigued by, you know, seeing a, a football or a basketball, or some people are intrigued by, you know, getting a paintbrush. I was intrigued by the beautiful wasps and the bees. I, I don't really, you know, look forward to getting stung. It's just kind of one of the... Uh, the hazards of my chosen you know, activities in life that I'm trying to answer questions about stinging insects. You know, I'd been stung, like I said, probably 500 or 1,000 times by honeybees. So I said, well, we've got to get some numbers. We've got to rate that owl is less than that owl, which is less than that owl. How do we do that? Well, come up with a pain scale. I usually work on, on the higher levels, the, the genus, which is kind of like the cluster of species that are all very similar. So the number I usually go by is in, in the book, Sting of the Wild, where I made a table of these, an appendix in the back, I have 83 listed. 10 fire ant stings hurt me about as much as one honeybee sting. So you can, you can continue that, that extrapolation. The 10 honeybee stings were heard about as much as one good Maricopa harvest ant. That's the red harvest ants we see running around on the sidewalks here in, in Tucson and in, in the southwest. 
you got 10 of those, 10 of the harvest ants would be about equivalent to one bullet ant or one tarantula hawk. So that's pretty much the relationship. There fortunately aren't any fives. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I love animals. I don't care if they're scaly, scary, hairy, toothy, or absolutely huge. Look at that swamp beast. Guys, do be aware that if I do immediately go into a state of paralysis, just... They've got a sting that's about six, seven millimeters, about a quarter of an inch long, a third of an inch. They'll get you, electrify, in one word. And if you can imagine that, that's about what it feels like. It's instantaneous, it's electrifying, it's clean, it's sharp, it's very pure, and it just totally shuts you down. It's like short-circuiting your brain. Your brain is sort of idling along, you think, oh yeah, you know, I'm still functioning. Well, wrong. So I tell people, if you get stung, don't try to be tough and all that, just lay down. Lay down and scream. All right, Coyote. You okay, man? Your heart racing? Million miles a second. This is the most nervous I've ever been to take a sting or bite from anything. My hand is shaking. Are you guys all ready? Oh yeah, I'm ready if you're ready. I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the tarantula hawk. Let's go for it. One, two, here we go, three. As long as you're screaming, you're, you're doing two jobs. You're screaming and trying to endure the pain. That's better than just enduring the pain. Oh my gosh! Oh! Oh! Okay. Ah! Tell me what you're feeling. I can't move my arm! And, and if you scream, most of us, like I have lung power, I can scream for about two or three minutes. By the time you finally run out of energy for screaming, you kind of like, oh, it, it, it doesn't hurt anymore. And you can see the stinger where it went in right there. I think there. we had this, this arms race, predator prey. We're, we're the predator and insects are the prey. And so I think what happened is they won. We're dreadfully afraid of that bees and stinging ants and wasps have won that war because they, they get into our head. For instance, a lot of people are afraid of shark attacks. But, you know, I recently saw a statistic that actually humans bite more humans on the New York City subway than sharks bite humans. And so, similarly, mosquitoes are an incredible problem because they transmit malaria. They're they can be fatal because of what they're carrying. And so, yeah, I think sometimes the, our sensation, our fear, doesn't necessarily map to where the actual risk occurs. We're all here together. This is like one planet, and we've had a lot of time here on this planet together, interacting with one another in these nuanced ways that science is just starting to uncover. It's one of the most exciting times in biology, but I'm sure that every biologist throughout time has said that, so. When we think about the history of uh, humans understanding the world around them and pursuing science, one of the very first steps was, were these explorations of the world, major collecting expeditions, where Charles Darwin and uh, Wallace would travel, collect specimens, bring them back. I think of it as a map, like creating a map of the biological world. type of research um, and we're still learning a lot. We're learning, we're discovering new species. I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist and I pursued marine biology for my master's degree. I studied marine isopods that live 
in the South Pacific Islands. And we would, for collecting, I would uh, put on full scuba gear and dive, go diving. And that was a really fantastic and fun experience. I also uh, fell in love with my advisor, who was one of the most amazing, open-hearted people I had ever met. We were, we were in love, and we, we decided to get married. And <laughs> it was a lot, a lot of big decisions all at one time. I needed to make a shift so that there wouldn't be such an overlap between my professional and personal uh, lives. And so I decided to switch to entomology to study basically the crustaceans of the land. I specialize on bombardier beetles. Bombardier beetles are special carabids. They are these masters of chemistry. They mix chemicals inside of their bodies in a way that creates an exothermic reaction just before it leaves the body of a beetle. My collaborators and I have a, a grant through the National Science Foundation where we're able to look at um, the, the genes involved in the production of defensive chemicals for these bombardier beetles. They'll, they'll blast you when you collect them and uh, it doesn't hurt too bad. It's not as hot as Brachinus, the other lineage of bombardier. It's not the boiling point of water, but it's definitely a bit of a shock. It would have turned around and driven away. Yeah, <laughs> you could tell there was a plan moving. <laughs> yeah. Amity Bill, what are you looking at? My personal mission um, tonight is to try to get more of those um, new species, the small bodied ones, but also to get as many of the larger Gonitropus kunsni as possible. I've gone beyond this point, so we're going to be in new territory. But once you've seen a few of them, you get, get an eye for it. And then just out of the corner of your eye, you'll see a black something moving at just the right speed. And it'll catch your attention, and you turn, and it'll usually be just out of reach. <laughs> I used to work on marine crustaceans and insects are basically just flying crustaceans so but the most exciting thing i ever did was hook up with wendy on a polynesia expedition to uh, tahiti and guam and fiji and that was the beginning of yeah. wendy and i yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there we go. <laughs> made in Goniotropus, <laughs> oh, too. Double. That's incredible. Was okay, that the so noise they made? Yeah, yes, those were that noise with the blast. the blast. That sounds worse than Burkinus. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. Oh, Even though yeah. I got some um, oh, burning yeah. on my fingers yeah, from the bombardier like that. blast. Cool. That's that was very fun. Wow. Now, here, that is probably Simendus. trap sample and that is uh, a kind of a flight intercept trap so this is a really convenient way to trap a lot of insects. I think what's extraordinary about looking through a malaise trap sample is that there's so many different shapes and colors and textures. I think the other thing about insects that's amazing is that they've been here for a lot longer and they they dominate Earth. They're in pretty much every habitat except for like benthic in the sea. Being in all of these different habitats and occupying all these different niches is what has allowed them to modify all these different structures to fit those spaces. And so that's part of it too, is that the story is kind of writ in the body. Flies generally have um, piercing slash sucking mouth parts. 
they look like puppies. They've got these beautiful little brown, wide-spaced eyes. Wow, that has a really crazy mouth, too. Whoa, this one has a crazy abdomen. So insects have an open circulatory system, so their air comes right directly into their body at different points along the whole length of their bodies. And so the spiracles are sort of equivalent to our nostrils. And it's just sort of odd to think about a nostril on your abdomen. When I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto, and um, Toronto is considered one of the most multicultural cities in the world by the United Nations, and I would do this in a little room by myself for several hours, and then I would go outside of the museum where I worked and walk on the sidewalk and think, this is not diverse. I guess, like, the standard setup of people, I'm over it. Is that weird? Like, there's just, like, a limited number of, like, types and shapes. This is an insect world. When we just look at the insects, that's 52% of described species. They are related to us on the planet, so, so we're more closely related to insects than we are to, say, plants and, uh, or microbes um, or fungi. These are the major groups of life on our planet. The reason why beetles are so successful, one of the reasons why, is they've developed um, a hard um, protective shell, which is called the elytra, which is actually the front wings, but they protect the hind wings, which are the flight wings. So structural differences are one reason why things can be so successful. Everything's kind of adapted to where, they're, where they occur. Things, you know, die out that can't adapt, and speciation events takes place. So everything's constantly evolving and changing over time. Those that survive the changes are the ones that are successful. The field of systematics involves naming species, determining how they're related to one another, and then establishing classification systems which, it, which are a nested sets of organisms based on their relatedness. Together, that shows us a map of how organisms evolved throughout the history of life on Earth. What we have here in this collection is the product of all of that time. Our goal is to take these specimens and to keep them forever for all future generations to study. For me, like, it just fills me up. It's like, it's so obvious, you know, that that is such a good thing to do. You definitely always need physical specimens because you can only do so much with an image, an image you can't analyze for molecular analysis. So the specimens in the collection are irreplaceable. If a specimen was lost or damaged, you can't go back to Mount Lemmon in 1942 and recollect that specimen. When those specimens were collected, the collectors and the people who've curated them all of these years had no idea what kind of sequencing technology was going to come down the line. It used to be that we would need to go collect specimens specifically for molecular phylogenetic analyses. Recent advances in sequencing technology allows us to sequence small pieces of DNA that are very fragmented. Museum collections are filled with specimens that have fractionated DNA that we could not use for genetic projects in the past but now they're perfectly suited for this new sequencing technology. And there are gonna be a lot of other technologies in the future that we can bring to bear on these time capsules. Natural history collections are time machines. Getting mic'd up, this is like 
double mic situation. Action. All right, guys, it's a big day on location here in Tucson, Arizona, because I am about to meet the King of Sting himself, the godfather of the Insect Sting Pain Index, Justin Schmidt. We are right outside of his house, and if you guys are ready, let's go inside and meet the man himself, Justin Schmidt. I'm expecting bullet ants. Oh, oh there he is! I see you've got some of our favorites over here, tarantula hawks. Yeah, we've got a couple Beautiful. of tarantula hawks. Celebrities. You're just gonna open that up, huh? Well, sure, you can see better yeah. <laughs> screens. See if Everybody at home watching is probably like, wait a minute, he just took the lid off of the tarantula hawk terrarium. See there? Oh, you're just gonna put your hand in there. Think so. No. But you see, what I'm doing is just demonstrating that mm -hmm. they really aren't out to get me. I mean, if they were out to get me, I'd be stung. Right. Now, if I put my thumb on the back mm -hmm. of them, I'm gonna get nailed. Yep, applying pressure is all a part and of it. I don't the, want uh, you getting out because then I have to catch you. Yeah, that's, I'll kind of lead us in and then yeah. I'll ask you some questions, you can tell me some stories, I'll give you some of my experiences. And, and then of course, when we're talking about experiences, I think what people really wanna know are probably like our, our top three. <laughs> <laughs> Four time, action. Let's, Let's talk go stings. for it. For me, the tarantula hawk almost put a line in the sand. <laughs> No pun intended when it came to completing the sting index because I will never forget what it was like. First of all, how intimidating that creature is to, to get that thing in the entomology forceps and it looks like and an alien. Strong. It is strong. The wings are going and you see that quarter inch stinger coming in and out of that abdomen and that moment where I'm like, all right. And it's sharp. I'm going to have to place this on my forearm and take this sting. <laughs> and when I finally worked up the courage to do that, you know, I do this countdown where it's three two, one, or one, two, Bingo. three, and boom, you place it down. The sting from that insect was electric in nature. I've, I've been shocked before by accidentally like, you know, taking a zap from a, like an oh, yeah. electrical have... cord, right? This was that times 10, and it put me on the ground. My arm seized up from muscle contraction because your mind goes into this state that's just, it's blank emptiness. And all you can focus on is the fact that there's pain. radiating pain coming out of your and that's arm. why you scream, because now you're focusing on something else. Yeah. Yesterday I woke up at 3 a.m., went to bed at 9.30, and then I got up at 4. Can you put this here? And I have a million other things to do. This morning they were all like, they put them here, and I was like, that's not going to work. Yay, bugs! Check it out. How many people do you think are here right now? So beautiful! <laughs> when you see, you know, a five, six, eight-year-old child, explaining science to other members. Of their group. They're so empowered, and it's really great. Crickets. So, they're crickets. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're like, it's like dehydrated onion. I got a drink. Not bad. It's not bad. Is it good? No. <laughs> Um, I can guarantee you that uh, over the course of my life, people have wondered why, why insects, why spend your time thinking about this all the time. But insects do everything, and I love them, and it's okay to follow something that maybe seems different to others, because that love really can fuel you through so much adversity. Can I help the tarantula? I never touch a spider in my life. Is he coming from the top? That's like a bird or somebody's trying to eat you. Human curiosity is, is really what drives us. You know, that's one distinguishing characteristic of us versus most other things. It's, we have this insatiable curiosity, and I think we, we need to feed that. We feed that through music and art and dance and language and poetry. But we feed it through exploring, and science is 
one of the fields that we explore. Once you realize how completely spectacular the natural world is, you are very driven to protect it. There's sheer beauty that that's, you know, what elevates the human spirit. That's what, that's what makes us special. If we aren't special, what are we? We're nothing.